Okay, so hi everyone. This is our first session that the Bishop Healy Committee is hosting regarding personal finance. Um, so this is the first session in our series that we're planning to implement over a period of time. Um, so this first session is going to deal around personal budgeting. So I have a few folks who are Holy Cross alum. I have Suji Yi, who's class of 2017. I have Ivan Watanabe, which is cl he's class of 2008. And I have Chris Morgan, class of 2016. Um, my name is Shuvo Dada. I'm class of 2017, part of the event planning um, committee within Bishop Healy, along with Amir Phillips, who's class of 2017 as well. Um, for the folks on the panel, would you guys mind doing a quick intro, maybe your class, job title, uh, your major? Um, we can start off with Yvonne. Oh, awesome. Uh, class of 2008, uh, again, Ivan Watanabe. Um, I was a political science and Spanish literature double major. So obviously, I'm now a managing partner of a financial planning practice here in New York. Uh, the, two, the, two, the two really line up, um, but that's what I'm up to these days. And then I guess, Chris, if you want to go next. Chris Morgan, um, class of 2016, uh, transitioned to a couple of roles, a couple of companies, but now I work with uh, Techno Apex as a corporate care manager. i um, been at this for about a year now. Uh, we'll see where the wind blows from there. Looking forward to uh, the conversation tonight. Sue, if you want to go next as well, I think a few folks are muted. Um, yeah, if you're if you guys are having sound problems, then let us know and we can try to fix them somehow. Um, but hi, everyone. My name is Suji. I'm class of 2017. I double majored in economics and Chinese at Holy Cross with a minor in Asian studies. I am doing nothing that is really particularly re directly related to any of those fields, um, but I am an admissions officer at Georgetown University, um, so still part of the Jesuit community. It's so nice to speak with you all today. Thanks, CG. And just to quickly introduce myself as a part of the Bishop Healy Committee. Um, my name is Shu Odetta, class of 2017, and I'm currently a product manager at Dell, so pretty much working on planning new Dell products. And Amir, if you want to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Phillips. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I work alongside with Shuvo on the event planning committee for Bishop Healy uh, and very similar to my friend Suji here, graduated class of 2017. And I work as an assistant director for multicultural recruitment at MIT, which is behind me. It's nice to see all of you. Thanks, Amir. So to kick it off, um, like I, like I mentioned, this is a series or a session regarding personal budgeting. So we kind of broke it out into separate portions that I thought I mean, Amir and you know, the panel thought would be a good sort of topic to discuss regarding personal finance, personal budgeting. So to kick it off, we're gonna discuss checkings versus savings accounts. So although this might seem like a very straightforward um, kind of concept, there are certain nuances and there are certain things that, you know, once you actually dwell into the, dwell into the intricacies, there are certain, certain things to keep in mind. So I'm going to have Yvonne and Suji kind of discuss checkings versus savings accounts 101. So either one of you two can want to kick it off. Um, for the first part of it, what are the fundamentals for these two types of accounts? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so checking account is, is essentially, you know, your operating account, really. I think most of the time that's where your paycheck will go into. Um, you'll probably pay your bills out of that particular checking account. Most checking accounts today don't really give you any type of interest or any type of accrual in the account. It's really so that you can uh, have your money come in, have your money flow out. And a savings account is something that, you know, well, today's interest rates are super low and it's a little bit difficult to get any type of uh, return on that. But basically that is where you are saving for some other type of future event, right? And, um, you know, I, sort of a best practice would be to send money from your checking account where your paycheck comes in and, and put money that automatically goes into this sort of accrual account, right? Um, Suji, would you add anything to that? 
Um, yeah, I would say that when I was going into just figuring out the differences or even trying to open a checking versus saving savings account, I think it really depends on what you are looking for each of those accounts. So for me personally, I remember I when I first opened a savings account, I went with a credit union, which is typically something that is in your local town. I liked it because I had a part-time job that paid that gave me a check once a month or would give me cash if I got tips or something. And so I needed something that would allow me to deposit my earnings in a cash form or in a check form um, and to be able to still access it more easily. And I thought at the moment that was a credit union. And then when I went to college, of course, my priority shifted and everything is direct deposit nowadays. Um, and so my, I guess my needs in terms of what I need in a checking and savings account has shifted where I don't even have an in-person bank anymore. I just, all of my banking is done online, but that is definitely different for each person, I would say. So I would say it's depending on what your own personal needs are. Um, I would say that to do a little bit of research on what different programs might offer. Um, and like Yvonne said, the interest rates are currently really low. I'm really sad at my savings account, but uh, that's usually what I think about um, about those two different types of accounts. Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a good point. You know, trying to there's so many different options out there for checking accounts and savings accounts. And um, for me personally, like I wanted to be able to walk into a bank when we could still, you know, walk into places. Um, I wanted to be able to walk into a brick and mortar bank just in case I had an issue. So um, I, I chose a combination of one that had a savings rate that was a, a really high, or at the you know at the time a higher rate but also had a local presence that I could walk into. Um, so for me, I chose Capital One to do my local banking because uh, there's a branch that's not terribly far away from me. Um, and then when you select a checking account or a savings account, you know, look at the details. There are a lot of them that, you know, might charge you a fee if you keep a minimum balance inside of the account or won't charge you if you, if you keep a minimum balance in the account, trying to figure out, you know, do I have to pay for checks? Is that something um, that, that uh, they're going to charge me, you know, is the account going to cost any type of fee or, you know, if, if I have a direct deposit, can I waive that? So just kind of understanding the different nuances, I think, between uh, the different types of checking accounts that are out there is important. That sounds very great. That sounds really good, especially, Suji, how you mentioned research. Um, to kind of expand upon that, are there any resources or any sort of websites or blogs or even podcasts that you both follow that you use to leverage or, you know, I know there are certain websites like NerdWallet out there that I use personally to figure out which banks are offering like the best interest rates. Are there any um, websites or resources that you two utilize? Uh, I mostly Google. <laughs> Um, if I am looking for a certain type of, it depends, I guess, what I'm looking for. If I'm looking, for example, when I switch savings accounts, I think I Google savings accounts with top interest rates at that moment. And I think NerdWallet was probably the first article that did come up. So I took a look at that. But I would try to look at a few different websites to see if there were any banks or any types of savings programs that were overlapping between those articles and say, oh, this this bank clearly has a great interest rate at the moment. Maybe I should go with them or people have good reviews on it. Um, and I think what Yvonne was talking about, some of those hidden fees or some of those caveats, I think are usually well, um, well discussed in some of these articles where they say, oh, make sure you have X amount in your bank account. Otherwise, they charge you for this fee. Um, so sometimes it's nice to look at some of those articles as well. Yeah, I think I think Google is for for really basic sort of nuanced uh, accounts and really just trying to get a flavor of of what are the basic you know different types of programs that are out there. Google is a perfectly fine place to go, and and you know Nerd Wallet is actually a really good resource that I use for myself when it comes to you know evaluating what are the different types of accounts that are out there and who's going to give me the best program. So I think I think that's a good spot. Awesome. So I guess to expand upon that, um, there's one thing that I thought, you know, would be beneficial or at least something I struggled with, you know, once I started to, you know, have a salary, started to make some money, 
there are also expenses that you know come along with that and then you know to pay for certain things you either have to decide between cash or credit or opening loans so i guess to kind of hone in towards the credit card feature um i guess what was what's your sort of general advice in terms of opening credit cards or determining which credit card to open for a specific purchase or any types of purchases um i'll have this you know, be directed towards Chris and Yvonne. So Chris, if you want to take it off, you know, regarding credit cards, are there any, what's your general advice in terms of opening a credit card, deciding which credit card is suitable for you? Um, if you want to kick it off. Absolutely. I think the deciding of credit cards is really, I'd say where Google or search engine is really going to be your friend. I mean, there's a number of different credit card options that really can tailor to certain individuals or certain lifestyles. So like, for example, I'll just focus on kind of the two larger areas that we usually see that are more common today. So um, credit cards that either give you cash back or credit cards that give you travel rewards or rewards based credit cards are fairly commonplace. Um, if you tend to be a person that likes to go on the weekend trip with some friends to the beach, when we can do so in a couple of months, hopefully, um, you know, maybe a travel rewards card is best for you. Um, if you're someone that, you know, isn't the big traveler and you just want to take the rewards that come back from having cash back in your pocket, um, then it might make sense to do a cash or a rewards based um, credit card. Now, the credit card in general is, I'd say, some, I'd say general advice would be to kind of use some, what we might say as a um, little bit of kind of common knowledge and what I've been told in the past with some family and friends is if you can't buy it three times, then don't buy it. Um, and when it comes to the credit side of the things, let's just say for a hypothetical situation, you have a credit limit of $10,000. That doesn't mean that every month you should go out and spend $10,000 if you can't pay off $10,000. While yes, you do have the ability as a lender to continue to spend that $10,000 every single month, whatever you don't pay off is going to start to build interest. And most credit card interest rates are very high. Um, it's almost high to the point where you might consider it a slippery slope. So um, that's why I'd say at least one piece of advice that I would give it some of the practice that I even uh, practice myself is I carry zero balance. So if you can carry a zero balance on a credit card, you're really just using that card simply for the building of your credit and for the rewards without reaping any of the negative consequences that come with it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally co-sign everything Christopher said. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when you do your research, I think the other thing I would consider is what are the, what are the interest rates and in, in a lot of the different programs that are available. Some might, might, might offer a zero interest rate for, you know, 12 months or two years, um, using leverage and using credit is, is always a good thing because the money is really, really cheap if you can do it the right way. But you do have to have a game plan on how you're going to pay this stuff back. I think where, where people get into trouble is, is everybody has a really good intention of paying back the debt that they, that they accumulate and then not actually following through with the discipline that it may take to, to pay off that debt. So I run my, my household the same way, you know, I, I put everything on my Amex and pay it off every month and never carry a balance um, to accumulate the, the points. Um, but, you know, I, I can tell you that even high income earners run up very, very high credit card bills and, you know, and um, and it can accumulate over time. So but I, I do think that it's important for people to establish credit to Christopher's point, like you for people for young people coming out of school opening up a credit card or people in college opening up a credit card and utilizing it responsibly, you know, and building up that credit history can really help you when you start to make larger purchases in the future. If you buy a car, if you're buying a house, you know, having a track record of, of paying back that debt, showing responsibility can actually help you on the back end um, when you go to, you know, when you go to secure those lines. So um, it can really be a great tool for people that use it responsibly, but for many, it can be something that you're, you know, you're trying to dig out of for, for a long, long time. And I think you really hit the nail on the head that responsibility piece is key. 
like if you use this tool responsibly, it can really help you boost your credit score. And I think another tip or trick, it's probably something you can find online as well. It's a tip that a family member of mine told me is to constantly, if you are, if you know and have your budget set, and we're, I know we're gonna talk about budgets later, but if you know or have your budget set, continue to have that limit increased. If even though you're not going to use that extra money on the top end, but have continued to every six to eight months, give your bank a ring, increase your credit limit. So then from a lender's perspective or your financial footprint, you are a more attractive lender because they, if I am a bank, let's say I'm a loan agency and you're looking to buy a house, I'm going to say, well, you've increased your credit limit from 5,000 to 20,000 over the past three years. And you still have a strong track record of paying off your credit card every month. So because of that, yeah. I view you as a responsible lender, I have no problem lending you two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars to purchase your home. So right. and I know I, not, I yeah. No, go ahead. No, no. I was gonna say, even though if you're not using that yeah. extra top end of the money, it's it's just there and it's working for you in the back end. Yeah. I think one of the things that, that typically comes up for folks is and we've touched on it already, sort of credit and credit score. Um, and what makes up a credit score. And I think, you know, as Christopher said, it, getting that larger line of credit, one of the things that, you know, impacts your credit score is how much of that credit do you utilize? So if I have a $5,000 credit limit and I use $4,000 of it, it's not going to look as good on my credit score because I'm using up 80% of that credit limit. If I have $20,000 available and I still only use that $4,000, that's going to be a significantly greater or lower amount of, of utilization. And so that percentage will help my credit score improve. And again, showing a large, a great track record, so on and so forth will really help with you uh, getting a better credit score, which leads to better lending. And, uh, and those types of things compound over time, right? So if I buy a car and my credit score is high and I buy a car the financing for that car is going to be cheaper than if I had a poor credit score and I bought that same car. So that car might cost me X percent more, which means I can save X percent less, which means I have less in the bank and less in retirement. And so all of those decisions that you make when you're young and getting out of college, um, you know, really truly make a difference and add up those small little decisions that you make. And do you mind if I just add something really quickly? Um, I think there are some credit cards as well. I didn't know this, but one of the very first credit card I opened um, as soon as I turned 18 was actually through Capital One. So shout out to Capital One. And they actually have a partnership, it seems, with a credit score company where you can you just get free assessments or you get free check-ins basically every month of how, how your credit score is doing. So if you don't have a credit card yet, you're thinking of opening one, try to see if any of the credit cards that you're looking at have partnerships like this uh, with a credit company so that you can keep track of that as well yeah i think one of the one of the things that i also like about my amex is that it um i i think it it automatically pays itself off for my checking account every month so it doesn't actually allow me to carry over a balance i think i think that's how one of my credit cards works it actually takes out whatever the balance is from my checking account automatically so you never carry a balance And to tie off that and to expand upon that regarding credit scores, I know for me personally, I opened my first credit card to buy an iPhone. So I bought, I had a, I got a credit card through Apple that they were offering and throughout like different purchases I made in my life, whether it's furniture or even clothing, like American Eagle was offering a credit card at the time. I know there's certain folks that get tied to, or they get marketed towards these store credit cards. Um, from your personal experience or from your overall knowledge, this is for the panel. Do you see any harm in opening up these different store credit cards? Like I've been, I opened up a credit card with Rotman's, Apple, Best Buy. So, I mean, I paid off the balances and everything, but do you see any harm in terms of opening up these different store credit cards? Only one watch out. I wouldn't call it a harm, but I would call it a watch out. If you are planning on making a large purchase that's going to require your credit score to be run, make sure that you haven't opened up one of these accounts within the past six-ish months. 
Um, because every time you, let's say you're in the store and they ask you for some information, oh, would you like to open a credit card? It runs your credit score for that. Or and it's going to show up on your credit, on your Equifax that you had a credit score check in order for you to apply for that store card. So let's say hypothetically you're going to go for a home loan next month. Well, if I was in the mall and I got an Apple card, a JCPenney card, and I don't know, a Sears card all in the same day, and then went three weeks later to try and get a home loan, from an Equifax perspective, they're going to look and they're going to say, what type of lender is this? They're trying to pull from multiple different, um, they're going to try to basically have debt in multiple different areas. I view this as a risky loan and your score is going to, your actual, uh, what you're going to qualify for is going to be different versus that if you didn't have those other pulls within the last six months. So it's not necessarily as a bad thing, but it's just really understanding where you are financially in life before going ahead and doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I personally have an Amazon credit card, and that was something that I got okay. recently just because I know that I do a lot of Amazon purchases. But like Chris said, just to reiterate the fact, like just watch out, it doesn't mean like, oh, great, now I can go and spend more money on Amazon, which... Amazon, we all know it's a slippery slope, but um, I I think it's thinking about if you think you would reap the benefits of that credit card, thinking if, or doing research to see if that credit card has um, an annual fee, and if you think that annual fee is worth it, um, and like Chris said, to not go crazy and open credit cards with like five different stores. I think it all depends on your personal I guess your personal experience with that particular store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think you've really got to be honest with yourself, right. And do an actual assessment of whether or not you have the discipline to have those lines of credit open and not use them in a, in a way that's going to potentially hurt you. Right. You just got to be, you know, is it really worth saving, you know, the 15 bucks to open up a credit card that may be, you know, more, uh, more harmful to you long-term if you don't have the discipline to pay something off, you know, then it's not, it's absolutely not worth it. I think, um, and, and going back to the original credit card question, you know, I didn't do a lot of research when I opened up my first credit card. I think my first credit card, I pay 300 bucks a year to, to keep the credit card. It's the oldest credit card I have on file. And so I don't even use it but I pay the $300 a year just to keep it open because it's the oldest line of credit that I have in my credit history. And so one of the things that makes up your credit score is what is the oldest line of credit that you have? So I essentially pay 300 bucks a year, 360 bucks a year to improve my credit, to keep my credit score high and to keep that line of credit open. So that decision that I made when I was, 20 years old or 17 years old, I've been paying 360 bucks for, you know, for I'm 34. Now I've been paying 16 years on this credit card times 360 bucks a year. You know, that adds up. Right. So um, now I'll never shut it down because it's the, again, it's the oldest line of credit that I have, but those are the kinds of decisions that if you make them early on with not eyes wide, eyes wide open, you know, could, could cost you long-term. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Yvonne. I mean, especially keeping and tracking like your credit cards. And I know I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, still maintaining your old line of credit because I was debating whether I should close a certain credit card. But now that you mentioned it and having that importance of, you know, your financial footprint and having your oldest line of credit still being available, I think that's important and often overlooked. Um, to expand upon that, and while we're on the topic of, credit cards and paying off credit cards. A part of that is budgeting your personal expenses. So I'm going to keep this topic open for all panels because I feel like everyone has their own sort of rule of thumb or any sort of principle that they follow. Um, I guess to kick it off with Chris, are there any sort, certain rules of thumb for any sort of uh, methodologies that you follow in terms of your personal budgeting, allocating your paycheck, determining, you know, what, obviously this depends on your personal financial standing, but are there any rules of thumb that you follow? 
Absolutely. There's a couple of rules that I follow and I think some are a little more traditional and others aren't. Um, you know, when it comes to I'll South focus on larger purchases first and then kind of go to the smaller purchases after. So for a depreciating asset, cars, uh, anything like of that nature, I try if possible to apply my principle. If you can't buy it twice, don't, don't buy it. Now, I've been in a position where I, I grew up with a couple of mechanics in my family. We're buying a used car pretty comfortably was a thing. I understand that was a pretty, that was a place of privilege. I mean, you know, some family members that were mechanics so that I wouldn't, I knew that I wasn't at least getting a straight up limit. Um, so I've been able to at least, you know, go in the used car route without having to go new with a level of comfortability for appreciating assets, um, homes or up, uh, if you were to buy an apartment or buy a townhouse, for an example, if you ever get to a place where you can finance owning a place versus renting, and that cost is either the same or relatively close, at the end of the day, you're going to save more money in the long term by making that switch and actually taking on that good debt and buying that home or buying that apartment, buying that town instead of just forking out rent every single month for years and years on that. Now, when it comes to the smaller purchases, that's the probably things that fit more into our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick thought exercise. Let's say we all still were going into work. Let's say I drive by a Starbucks every day to work. I get a macchiato something, long fancy name, pink drink. Chris it's obviously goes to Starbucks every day. <laughs> it's, well, yeah, it's just coffee every day. It's, let's just say round figures is five bucks a day, five times a week. And then you've got 52 weeks. So I just spent $1,300 on coffee a year. So if I were to take a look at these just small expenses that slowly compound throughout the year, you can honestly say, well, if I make my coffee at home for $5 a week instead of $5 a day, I just cut my expense for coffee down from $1,300 a year down to $200 a year. So it's little areas like that where it's like you don't necessarily need to kind of go all out and live a lavish lifestyle um, in order to still live comfortably. Um, where it's just small changes in day-to-day -day activities can really go far as far as budgeting from like an annual or monthly perspective. So yeah, I, I think um, I think for for me. Listen, I, I think there's there's the ideal and then there's sort of the reality, right? And, you know, um, when I first graduated from Holy Cross, I was just trying to get by, right? I, there, I didn't have any room to save money. I was just trying not to go backwards into debt. And I think if you can start there and live within your means and really make sure, you know, when you're entering the workforce, if you can not move backwards, that's a victory, for most people, right? Um, but one of the things that we tell all of our clients, depending on income, you know, I want my clients to save about 15 to 20% of their gross income. If you saved about 20% of your gross income every single year, I personally don't care. You could light the rest of the money on fire. If you save 20% of your gross income every single year, then you're gonna be in a really good spot in the future for retirement, right? Um, so I want, I want folks to try to, once they're past the, I can survive and, and pay my normal bills and I'm not moving backwards. If you can save first, and that's how we were talking about earlier from checking the savings and automatically transfer 20% or, you know, start to participate in some of the retirement accounts available to you. That's where I would start. Right. And then start to accumulate more. And then, you know, if you can ratchet that savings to 21% or 22% or 25%, the more you're able to save, the better off you're going to be on the back end. And I, again, I, I, you know, I want people to spend their money, but I want them to save first. And then I really, frankly, don't care what you do with the rest of it, right? If you want to spend a thousand dollars a month on a car, but you're saving 30% of your income, I'm good. Yeah. You know, it, I'm totally fine with that. Um, you know, I don't really tell people how to spend their money, but I think if you're able to save first then you can do what else, you know, what else, whatever else you want to do. 
Um, and going off of that point, I think when I first graduated from Holy Cross, I have always been in the nonprofit field and Amir can echo this. The nonprofit field obviously doesn't pay that well. And so I think similar to what Yvonne was talking about, I think I would, I mean, at that point I was kind of living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, just making sure that I could pay rent, eat, eat, eat food on a normal basis. Um, but one of the very first things that I did was put money towards a retirement account because that is one of the perks that my work gave me and I wanted to take advantage of that. And so if you are in a nonprofit field or any company really that you're a part of, take a look to see what retirement programs they do have and just take advantage of it because oftentimes companies will match whatever percent you put in and those matching programs are just is just free money that is going towards your retirement account. And even if it's 60 bucks a month or $100 a month that is going towards your retirement. Um, it's just money that you don't think about probably for, for 11 months of the year. Um, and maybe you'll check up on it every now and then. But I really liked doing that in the beginning when I first got my job, just because I could truly see what my actual quote unquote take home pay was and not really even consider that as part of my paycheck. And so I would yeah. take a look at my take home pay. And I think this really depends on thinking once again, what your priorities are. And so like I said, after I graduate, shortly after I graduated from Holy Cross, I had moved out of my home, I was living on my own. And so my priority at that moment was to be able to pay for rent was to be able to um, be able to still have fun and go out to eat. Oh, what a throwback. Remember when we used to be able to go out to eat everyone <laughs> and not feel like we were going to die in a pandemic. Um, but that was what my priority was at that point. And then I reassessed what my priorities were shortly after, I think a year, a year I was living out on my own and a year in, I said, okay, what are my priorities now? And I thought, okay, I really want to pay off these student loans. Like that is my other, that is my next priority in my life. And so um, I moved back home and I know that is a privilege to be able to have a free home to be able to move back to. And so that's what I did. And my priority was to pay off my student loans. But I think a good rule of thumb or a good place to start that I know that a lot of people like to start a good starting place, I think, is a 50, 20, 30 rule where people say you can put 50 percent of your um take home money so after taxes after you put it into retirement etc that take home pay put 50 percent of that towards your living expenses and what people call your must-haves so food is a must-have um, that is where 50 percent of your money will go 20 percent like Yvonne was talking about will go into a savings account money that will be there in case you need emergency money and then 30 percent will um, be just recreational, I believe, discretion, or no, 30% is debt payment, sorry, 30% is debt payment. And so student loans, car payments, etc, is where 30% will go. But that, of course, can be shifted, you don't have to be so disciplined. I would say it really, it's acknowledging the type of person that you are acknowledging if you know you're disciplined enough to fit to follow a rule like this, to continue following it, to be disciplined but if you know you're not that type of person if you know you can't say okay 50 percent of this will go towards living etc to savings um then it's being honest with yourself um and i know it probably sounds like i'm a really disciplined person but i promise you and my boyfriend could also tell you there are definitely times where i fall off the rails as well and maybe i'll spend um, more than I should have on particular months or even particular days. Um, but it's not beating yourself over that. I think it's about looking forward and knowing what you can do from here on out, as opposed to regretting those decisions and really beating yourself down about it. And I think it's always just learning from your mistakes. So, yeah. so I, I think that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Yvonne. No, I, was, I, I like I, I like this, the thought process there. And especially I think one of the things about the retirement plans that are so easy is that you just tell your payroll how much you want to put in and they just take it from your paycheck. Right. And then unfortunately, what happens is money hits our paycheck or hits our checking account and then many of us will spend it. And so there are opportunities and some payroll companies will there are some some companies will do this for you is you can actually just say, hey, you know, can you 
and can you send 95% of my pay, my after-tax paycheck to my checking account and maybe 5% to my savings account? So if you can have it you know, automated, you'll have a lot more success, I find, than if you just leave it up to your own devices, have it hit your paycheck, and then count on yourself to save it. Um, so if you can autom automate the process or have it hit your checking account and then have your checking account automatically send it to your savings account, many accounts will allow you to do that. Um, you're, ha you're gonna have a lot of success with saving. Uh, Suji, I, I just wanted to also mention that all of the points you hit are like spot on. And, and even some of the areas that you were kind of ending your, uh, your chat with, uh, you know, we're not perfect. And if you follow this budget to like a T every month, like you have to have a little fun at times, you know, it's, it's life. You have one of them, so you might as well kind of enjoy it. Um, the, the many months I can tell you my first year out of college when, you know, you, you take the Uber by yourself instead of getting the pool on the way home. And it's like, ugh, could have saved 10 bucks, but you know, it, it's all, it's all part of the, all part of the experience. Um, three parts, throughout two points that you mentioned though, Suji, that I wanted to kind of add a little bit to you as well. Um, the 401k is like for companies that offer matches, it's free money at an absolute minimum, reaching, uh, putting in your 401k, whatever the match is from that, your company or organization or place of hire, um, is, is almost like leaving free money on the table. So without doing like that should be just the bare minimum if you can afford it. Um, and hitting it early is always the better of the two than late. I think it's, um, I don't have the, the firm number on me, but generally speaking, if you start your 401k like five or six years early, it can like turn into almost a million dollars with compound interest before you retire. Um, like it's, it's some astronomical number. Um, so, you know, starting your 401k as early as you can comfortably um, is definitely something that's going to pay dividends in the years to come. The another area that you mentioned that uh, I didn't, I'd say probably take really seriously, um, like I should have, was the rainy day fund. Um, at least early on when I first graduated, you know, you never know things happen. Um, especially now we're facing COVID dynamics. Um, you know, there's just a multitude of situations that could occur where your income could be impacted, and being able to comfortably survive any type of um, disruption in your in your take home pay you know, could really be the make or break point. So, you know, everyone has, I'd say, probably a different feeling. I'm more risk averse. Um, so, you know, it's, it's months of savings in that rainy day fund just in case. But um, I think that's another one that's like really important because, you know, again, we just never know what cards might be dealt in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I could go outside tomorrow to go drive in and my car might not start now where that has to be fixed. It's a fund that you can dive into. Um, another, and my last point is actually an app um, that I've met a buddy and I, don't know, I call him a friend, um, Christian Zimmerman, he started an app called Coins. Um, it takes, it rounds up your purchases and puts that money towards eliminating debt. So this could be either credit card debt, this could be student loans, um, really however you'd like to apply it, but it rounds up your purchases and puts that money aside. Um, it's almost like so other, I think there's like Acorns, it's other similar apps, but Acorns is more for your savings account, whereas they focus on debt elimination. Um, so there are kind of these little cool ways where you can, um, you know, continue to save money, but also uh, cut back on any debt that might exist, ex including student loan debt. I'm glad you mentioned that, Chris, because that kind of leads into our, our next topic regarding apps and tools to monitor your personal finances. I know I personally use Excel just because I live in Excel as work for work. I'm pretty familiar with the different formulas and functionalities, but I know there are a ton of other apps like you mentioned Coins, Acorn, even Mint, for example, or Pocket Guard. Are there any apps or tools that the panel that you got that you all utilize in terms of monitoring your personal finance? Shiva, I had to laugh because I thought I was going to be the only person on here that said Excel. <laughs> I use Excel. Uh -oh. I, yeah. I use Excel too, actually. <laughs> like, Same here. Yeah, I gave Mint a try, and like I felt I like time it. that I was spending reallocating or recharacterizing like certain smaller expenses. It just kind of got annoying. 
Um, but if it's, if your regular places where you either shop or pay bills are automatically categorized incorrectly, like mint's awesome. But it was like, it was kind of annoying uh, to have to kind of go in and double back on things where I was like, if I just go in Excel, it's, it's a couple keystrokes and I'm done uh, mm-hmm. every time. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I we we have a uh, a software that we use internally at the firm, but I think I think Mint is really good for aggregating your accounts, right, and giving you like a high level view of where your stuff is. So being able to see your four hundred one k account and your savings account, and your checking account, and your credit card balances, you know, your mortgage statement if you have one of those, like it, it kind of puts everything in one spot, so at least you can see where you are on a day to day basis. Um, you know, that's what I would use Mint for, not for like a cash flow tool, right? I think that's where, as you were saying, like it, it starts to become cumbersome and then you just say like, I don't, I, it becomes too much and you decide that you can't use it anymore. Um, but I'm, I'm the same way. I use Excel and then I use our internal stuff, but, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't like Mint either, mostly because I tried using it during a time where I was living paycheck to paycheck. And every time I would open my Mint, it would always tell me I was in the negatives and it didn't make me feel good about, but I knew that I knew that I was paying off my credit card like in full each month. Um, but in Mint's eyes, I was spending the money that I didn't have. So essentially, I just didn't like it when I tried to give it a try. Um, and I use Excel. And I think even to this day, there's different methods that I've come across different YouTube. There's a lot of YouTube videos of like ways mm. that I track my personal expenses or ways that other people will do that. So it really is about just finding your own method and seeing what works for you. When I was in college, I used to actually jot down every single purchase that I made in Excel. And I would also write down like which credit card I use. And I would basically have my own Excel version of Mint um, that calculated all those expenses. But now I, I think that's way too complicated since I make more purchases more often in my life now. Um, so I had to shift that a little bit and do it more of a more of a, I guess, overview or a calendar view of what I'm spending, because that personally helps me know what I'm spending my money on and know when, to, when I need to kind of cut back a little bit. Yeah, if I could just jump in real quick. Um, I think for me, I haven't, I haven't been the best in regards to like balancing the way in which I spend money up until I started grad school. Um, so I just started grad school at Northeastern and um, I didn't want to take out additional student loans for it and I'm living at home. So a lot of the classes that I pay for, you know, I have to make sure that I save my money or, you know, utilize my money in a way to make sure I can cover the cost of my classes. And so once I started to, you know, have to pay two, three grand for classwork and stuff like that, I was like, okay, I need to have a better system. And I actually use Excel as well, uh, because in addition to trying to pay off my Holy Cross loans, thanks Holy Cross, um, I'm also trying to make sure I have enough money for, you know, like I said, my grad, my grad classes, um, you know, just like day to day things, you know, going to the gym, stuff like that. And so even though like, it's not like one of the fancy apps or whatever, like, it's really, really nice to be able to just put my stuff in an Excel and be like, okay, like, I know this is coming up. Um, how do I need to shift this around a little bit and like, see it. I'm very much like a visual, I need to visually see like what Mm -hmm. I'm doing. So to be able to put that in Excel and then have like the little Excel, um, app on my phone so like when I'm like mo- moving around or from at, at home I can just check it like that has been really really helpful for me um and so if that I just want to add my my little tidbit like if you just graduated or you know you you trying to figure out all that whatnot and just trying to um keep your head on straight when you start making money and trying to make smart moves I definitely think Excel even though it's not like again like one of the budgeting apps I think Excel is like a really excellent way for you to just watch how you're spending stuff yeah, I think something is better than nothing. You just got to kind of beta, you know, test everything out, test a couple of them out, try it for a month, see if it works for you. If it doesn't, get rid of it. Um, you know, I I totally agree. I think I think you just got to find what works for you. And Excel Excel works pretty 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 well for for uh, for your basic needs for sure. Well, thank you, everyone. I mean, we also have some time for Q and A. 
So I want to leave some time. If, any, if anyone in um, any of the attendees has any Q&A, feel free to use the Q&A feature and then we can address those questions. However, we also had questions that came in as folks registered for the event. Um, I know some of these were addressed already, so I don't want to readdress them, but there was one that I feel like that a lot of, this would apply to you know a lot of people who are in this call, but how do you, this is for the panel, how do you budget for social life activities? I know, Suji, you touched upon this, but I guess just to hone in on just social life, how do you budget for that? Or I know everyone's different, everyone has different, you know, personal financial sort of um, standings, but rules of thumb for social activities. Um, I just, I wanna say this something real, something to this real quick that I, I don't, I've only recently really learned and it really hits me and it might hit whoever asked this question, but like, when you start realizing that there is like a transaction, like there is like a, a, there's a number, like you have to spend a certain amount of money to hang out with people. The way you choose who you're hanging out with, <laughs> or who you're spending your time with, really starts to shift because you think about like that, going out to lunch or whatever the case is, like that, that might be 60, $70 right there. And you don't wanna be sitting there fake laughing and stuff like that. So I think like from like a social standpoint, right? the way that I've learned to budget my social life activities is like, I really be thinking like, do I want to spend money to actually go meet up with this person? And then from like a financial That's standpoint, but I'm just being real. Like, you know me, I'm just being real. Is that why like, you canceled on me, Amir? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I literally got, let's not even go there. We, we met up. I'm just up. kidding, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> uh, but from a financial standpoint, right? Like, again, like there are things that like, I have to spend, you know, bi-weekly or monthly. And so I need to like, I, I literally like sometimes sit down and like plan out how much money, how much free money that I want to be able to utilize during a given time. Um, and that's the same with like social life activities. And sometimes you got to buy, like, I still have to pay off my loan. So sometimes I got to let people know I can't, I can't hang out right now. Cause I just, I'm not going to have, I don't want to spend that money to do that when I know I need to, I need to, you know, get this together over here. Um, so that's just like the kind of realistic like when you're at Holy Cross, dining dollars is nice. You can just meet up at Crossroads, <laughs> whatever the case may be. But like, there's a very real like price tag that comes along with a lot of stuff that you do after you graduate. Um, and so that's just yeah. kind of how I've been kind of taking it. But also there, I think there's also activities that you can do with friends or social activities that you can do that doesn't cost a ton of money. Or even when you are out eating at a restaurant, oh, I miss those days. Um, but thinking to yourself and saying, do I really need that second drink or that second dessert with my with my meal? Um, thinking about small things like that, because I mean, we all know, even if you get a drink, if you get like a glass of wine with your dinner, that's like what, 12, 15 bucks right there. Um, and that, like Chris mentioned before, all of that money will add up. So really thinking to yourself, and this is where a little bit of that discipline will come in and saying, do I really need that second glass of wine? Or do I need that? Um, do I really need to get dessert? Or do I need to get an appetizer with this meal? Or is just the entree good enough in this person's company? Or you can try to have more, um, I guess, free activities with your friends or social gatherings. I mean, during this time of COVID as well, like, I know that um, I've liked going on walks with my friends, mostly because we can't go out to eat at restaurants, but going on walks is always nice with your friends, or you can even suggest picnics when it's warmer out, of course, but trying to be creative and think of other low budget um, activities that you can do with your friends, I think is always um, another alternative. It just takes a little bit more thinking um, and to be a little bit more creative, I think. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, even on the small gathering things, I mean, sometimes a small gathering at, let's just say, again, the pandemic's not a factor, but um, a small gathering could be just as fun, if not more fun, than going out to the restaurant. So like instead, you, let's say there's a group of four, five, everyone brings a dish and an appetizer or a dish and a dessert and comes on by and you've got game night and you've got a good time, nice space, good food, good friends, good laughs. And, you know, you would have a similar experience, if not the same experience going to a restaurant, but, you know, everyone just saved themselves X amount of dollars by being able just to come to one meeting place and, and to have that good time. And, and um, I think Amir hit another good point of, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you pick and choose kind of which direction you go towards based off of the extensive 
hobbies. Um, you know, I, I will say I didn't, I, I was, my hobbies have changed <laughs> since uh, I first graduated until now, but I mean, yeah, I was just trying to be as smart as I could because I had a lot of friends that lived in the city. I unfortunately did not. So I knew that, you know, you had to be smarter Monday through Friday in order to get into the city to have a good time with your friends and then get back at the end of the day. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, every decision, um, it, it definitely is possible to, you know, still have that social life. You just kind of have to give and take along the way in some cases. That's a good point. I feel like the underlying message from that I'm hearing from everyone on the panel is learning how to cook in general. I, I'm like over the weekend, I spent like, I don't want to mention how much I spent at restaurants, but I realized I could have cooked the same meal at home for a fraction of the cost. Um, so if that's one thing to keep in mind is try to hone in on, I think one, like a hobby you mentioned, Chris, I think cooking is probably one of the most fruitful hobbies that you can probably gather or get, gather over the years. Uh, let me see if there's any other Q&A in the function. Um, so I know there's some, there some questions regarding paying off loans and 401k. So I kind of want to hold off on that until we further, until we progress further into the series, because some of these can be their own sort of workshop. So I'm, I don't think we'd be able to tie off any um, solutions to those answers in a five minute time frame. But keep on a lookout for everyone on the who, who's a, who's joined this call. Keep on a lookout for for Bishop Healy. We have some you know upcoming events regarding 401ks, um, buying your first house, different topics that we're all navigating as we you know as you're thinking about you know thinking about going into these different areas or if you're upon if you're about to graduate as well. So we'll definitely hit these hit these topics in the future. Um, I just wanted to thank the panel as well. Like, I feel like throughout the years being, you know, working full time, I feel like I've had a strong sort of personal rule of thumb that I followed, but I feel like I've, I've definitely learned from Suji, Vaughn, Chris, all the different methodologies and experience that you guys mentioned. I'm definitely going to still instill that within me as I plan my, you know, future, future expenses. Um, Do you mind yeah, if I, I add one more thing? Shiro? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I think something that often isn't talked about enough, but um, I wish it was, especially as I was graduating from Holy Cross, I think there's, I think maybe it's a societal pressure um, or it's a societal thing that it's looked down upon or people feel some type of shame if you move back home after college or after you graduate, there is definitely no shame in that. And I would say that even me moving out of my own home, I think that large and largely was due to that pressure that I felt like, oh, am I a failure or, oh, should I be moving out of my home? Is this something that should be happening? Um, but you shouldn't feel that whatsoever. There's no shame. If you have the privilege to live back at home, then I would say definitely take advantage of that. Um, even if your commute is a little longer, it is totally worth it as soon as you pay off that loan it'll feel so good and be really worth it in the end but don't be afraid or don't feel shameful about living back home um yeah I just wanted to make that point <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that too because I'm still living at home even though I'm what three three and a half years out of, out of Holy Cross oh, me too <laughs> <laughs> Um, right now I'm in the process yeah. of looking for a place, but like like Suji mentioned, there's no shame. Like if it's if it's if it's an option for you, um, definitely save a lot of money, and this also you get to spend time with your family as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had to laugh when you said that, Shiva, because I'm like severely jealous of you guys. I mean, I will say, if my first opportunities were closer to home, I definitely hands down would have done the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's really uh, it's a quicker way. Again, if you have that opportunity or that privilege to do so, um, it's a really quick way to save some money or to pay off some debt pretty quickly. Um, you know, again, if that situation is available to you. So, um, you know, kudos to the families for keeping the doors open um, and, and for you guys to, to, you know, have that equal balance between freedom at home, but also living by the parents' rules. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I, I think just making the right decision for you, right? Bottom line. Right. Saving as much as you can, you know, 
living at home if you need to, paying down debt however you need to, spending time with friends and family however you feel, you know, is right for you. I think, you know, doing and making financial decisions in particular to please other people is never going to work out well for you, right? Mm -hmm. So you just got to be real with you and make whatever decisions, you know, are best for you because they're not, you know, they're not paying your bills. They're not going to pay for your retirement. They're not going to, they don't understand what's going on there. So I, I just think, you know, ultimately just being real with yourself and making whatever decision you need to for yourself is, is always the way to go. You know, money aside. Well, I think we're at almost approaching eight o'clock and I want to thank, like I mentioned before, I want to thank the panel for providing, you know, value advice, your personal experiences. I feel like I, if I was still a student or if I was in my first year, you know, working full time, I would definitely would have taken advantage of these different, you know, tips and tricks to instill within me. But for all the attendees, like I mentioned, keep an eye out. I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a survey to get your general thoughts. Then also be gathering some further ideas to see what other, you know, what other series or what other workshops can we implement into this personal finance um, series. So keep an eye out. And I also want to thank the panel. And with that being said, I hope everyone has a great, you know, holidays. Hope everyone has some restful breaks, uh, you know, with, with 2020, hopefully 2021 will, you know, will be a better year for everyone in terms of different aspects of life. But just want to thank you all for joining the call and being a part of this. Thank you, Shiva. And, and to, the students, to the students on the call, you know, I, I tip my cap to you guys. I cannot imagine what it must be to be a student in this environment right now, to be learning from home. Um, you know, I, I really tip my cap to you guys. So keep up the fight. Um, you know, just, just know that we're the alumni. We're here for you guys if you need anything. Most definitely. Definitely here for you guys. Be well, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care.